On behalf of the diversity committee, we are pleased to have you join us today. I'm Ken Marlowe, a partner in the national office practicing in the policy and regulatory healthcare FDA group. I also am a member of the diversity committee. As you are aware, we have been hosting a series entitled conversations about race. And today we are hosting our third speaker for the 2021 ongoing conversations about race pride month edition series in celebration of lgbtq pride month every year in june the u.s and many other countries around the world celebrate and commemorate lgbtq equality and honor the 1969 stonewall uprising that began in manhattan since the start of the modern lgbtq and liberation movement in the 1970s hundreds of independent pride events have sprung up around the world with each event tied to the Stonewall riots in June. As part of KNL's celebration of pride, I'm very excited to introduce our guest speaker and moderator. Today we have with us Kevin Jennings, the CEO of Lambda Legal, and Chuck Royce, real estate and finance partner in our Seattle office, leading us in a powerful discussion on the progression of the LGBTQ rights movement and where we are in today's society. Founded in 1973, Lambda Legal is the oldest and largest national legal organization whose mission is to achieve full recognition of the civil rights of lesbians, gay men, bisexuals, transgender people, and everyone living with HIV through impact litigation, education, and pu public policy work. As a 501c3 nonprofit organization, Lambda Legal does not charge its clients for legal representation or advo advocacy and receives no government funding. Lambda Legal is an incredibly important advocate and resource to the LGBTQ community. With that, I'll now turn it over to Chuck. Appreciate Kevin taking time out of his schedule to talk with us today. Um, Kevin, I, I know we have a lot to go over, but I thought it would be great if we could start off just talking a bit about um, historic attitudes towards LGBTQ people in the United States. Well, first of all, thank you so much to KNL Gates and to the almost 500 people who've tuned in. I know none of you were sitting around thinking, I've got nothing to do, uh, that you're all incredibly busy and you're making time to be part of this program is deeply appreciated. So thank you and happy Pride Month. Um, that's a great question. I actually started my career 36 years ago as a high school history teacher in Providence, Rhode Island. And I was in 1994 on the committee which created LGBT History Month, which is celebrated every October. So you can take the teacher out of the classroom, but you can't take the classroom out of the teacher. So of course I have a slide I'd love to share. Uh, let's see if I can do that. Um, what's really interesting to me um, about LGBT history in America is that LGBT people are not the newcomers. Prejudice against us are the, is the newcomer. Now we know this because we know that within native cultures, there was a tradition called two-spirit people. Two-spirit people were people who inhabited, were inhabited by both male and female spirits, and they played a third gender role. If we were to try to slap, it's always dangerous to slap labels on people from the past when you're using current terminology, but I guess you would refer to two-spirit people in the pre-colonial time as trans people. We know the existence of very specific individuals such as Weiwa. Weiwa was an individual who was part of the Zuni tribe of what is now New Mexico in the late 1800s, and Weiwa was actually chosen by the Zunis as part of a delegation to Washington in the 1880s to meet with President Cleveland and negotiate a new treaty between the Zuni and the U.S. government. Now, we all know how much bigotry there is towards trans people in contemporary American society. The American Medical Association has deemed violence against trans people an epidemic. And I think it's a fascinating thing to reflect that before the arrival of the colonists, Trans people, as we would call them today, were so respected among native people that they would be sent as part of official delegations to represent the tribe. Now, this changed with the coming of the colonists and the first capital crimes law was promulgated in the colonies in Massachusetts Bay in 1642. And the most relevant one for us is uh, crime number eight, if a man lieth with mankind as he lieth with a woman, 
Both of them have committed abomination. They both shall surely be put to death. This is kind of the great, 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 great grandfather of what became known as sodomy laws. And as I'm going to talk about a little bit later, um, sodomy laws remained on the books in many states in America until the 21st century. So it's fascinating to see the traditional attitudes towards LGBT people and how that changed with the coming of European colonists. Where did the idea of gay rights come from? Probably surprisingly to many people, it really came from Germany. Um, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, there was a vibrant LGBT rights movement in Germany um, led by a man named Magnus Hirschfeld. Now, this man, Henry Gerber, was a German immigrant to the United States. We don't know if he learned of Hirschfeld's work before he immigrated or when he was sent as part of the American army after the war to occupy Germany. But we know that when he came back from his tour of duty after the First World War, he founded America's first LGBT rights group, a group called the Society for Human Rights, which was incorporated in 1924 in Chicago. And that was literally the first gay rights group in American history almost 100 years ago. And what's fascinating about it, you all have probably done incorporations for nonprofits. You know that all nonprofits need to have a mission statement to incorporate. And his mission statement says, to promote and protect the interests of people who buy mental and physical abnormalities. Now, you may be surprised to see that language in a gay rights group mission statement, but you have to remember that back in the 1920s, same-sex sexual relationships were still illegal thanks to sodomy laws, and being gay was deemed a mental illness, which it would remain until 1973. What's really radical, though, is what he says next are abused and hindered in the legal pursuit of happiness, which is guaranteed them by the Declaration of Independence. What Gerber says, which no one in American history had said before in 1924, was the problem was not that people were LGBT. The problem was they were being denied their rights. And that was an incredibly radical statement for 1924. So he was very much ahead of his time. That's pretty fascinating. I mean, Ken Marlowe mentioned that Pride Month, June, is celebrating the, the, you know, the commemoration of the Stonewall riots in 1969, which generally is regarded as sort of the beginning of the LGBT rights movement. But clearly that's not the case, that there were already some efforts long earlier. So how, how did the Stonewall uprising play into, you know, what became uh, the growing movement? Well, the Stonewall Uprising really did mark a very important turning point in um, LGBT history. It had been um, common standard operating procedure in major cities in America, including uh, ones where uh, the firm has offices like Seattle, for the police to go into LGBT bars in the 40s, 50s, and 60s to rough up the patrons, to extort them for money, to threaten to publish their names in the newspaper, because beginning in 1953, when President Eisenhower signed Executive Order 10450, it was actually illegal for the federal government or a federal contractor to knowingly employ an LGBT person. So if your name was published in the paper, your career was over. And the police did this routinely. And in 1969, they came into a bar in New York called the Stonewall, and the patrons had just had enough, and they fought back. And they decided, we're not going to be treated like this anymore. And it initiated three days of violence on the streets of New York City. And that event, called the Stonewall Riot, marked a turning point where LGBT people who had struggled under discriminatory laws and police misconduct and other obstacles simply decided they weren't going to take it anymore. And so the next year, that riot was commemorated with the first Pride March in 1970, um, and Pride has been celebrated in June ever since. And how did things change after that? You know, after the Stonewall riots, um, you know, initially it was localized in New York, but how did that change for LGBT, you know, what change was wrought for LGBT people following that throughout the country? Well, there was really a flowering of LGBT organizing uh, in the 1970s as a result of the Stonewall riot and the new attitude that happened in the community. One example, that's Land Illegal, which was incorporated in 1973, where the oldest, as was mentioned, legal advocacy organization for the LGBT community. What is interesting is in 1973, that idea was so radical and so out there that the state of New York turned down our charitable status application 
arguing that we had no legitimate reason to exist. So Lambda Legal's first client was Lambda Legal. Lambda Legal had to represent itself in court in order to get the right to exist in the first place. And throughout the 70s, there was a tremendous flowering of um, LGBT rights activism, uh, leading to Wisconsin becoming the first state to ban discrimination based on sexual orientation in 1982. Now, as virtually everyone on this call knows, that kind of early peak of the LGBT rights movement coincided with the appearance of a strange cancer among gay men, which doctors couldn't understand because it didn't usually attack young, healthy men, called Kaposi sarcoma. It was something that attacked elderly people, usually of Mediterranean descent. And they nicknamed it first gay cancer because they couldn't figure out why only gay people were getting it. Then they began to realize that these young gay men were dying of all kinds of ailments you shouldn't die of in your 20s and 30s. And they realized their immune systems were collapsing. So they called it GRID, Gay-Related Immune Deficiency Syndrome. Then they began to recognize that other people were dying from this as well. It wasn't just gay people. And they um, changed the name to Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome or AIDS. Now, AIDS was a tremendous setback for the LGBT movement in the 80s and 90s. In New York City alone, 150,000 gay men died of AIDS from 1981 to 1995. That is three times as the number of Americans who died in the Vietnam War. So the movement was tremendously impacted by the um, AIDS crisis, and it wasn't until treatments became available in the mid-late 90s that AIDS went from being a death sentence to being a chronic illness. And in many ways, AIDS sparked a new level of activism. There were groups like ACT UP that engaged in nonviolent civil disobedience to force the government to do something about AIDS. But the reality is, is despite the unintended side effect of more activism for our community, AIDS was an unparalleled tragedy that cost literally hundreds of thousands of people their lives. Kevin, how did it, uh, you know, the AIDS crisis also impact, you know, public attitudes and the progression that, you know, you're not only losing members of the LGBT community and, you know, your ability to focus on advocating for rights is diminished because you're just trying to kind of fight for survival and take care of friends and family. Um, but presumably that also had an impact on how, you know, public perception of the, the rights movement was treated. Well, if there's any silver lining in the AIDS cloud, and I would, you know, having lost my first boyfriend, my college roommate, my best friend from college, I would ha be hesitant to say there's a silver lining. But the one thing AIDS did was it made LGBT people visible for America. Uh, people who had previously been closeted came out for two reasons. First of all, because they were sick, and secondly, because they were fighting for their lives. So there was an unprecedented flowering of visibility as a result of AIDS in the 80s and 90s. And America, I think, became much more aware that LGBT people were friends, were family members, were coworkers, were neighbors in a way they hadn't been before. Um, so I think the AIDS crisis brought a new level of visibility to the community, albeit in a very tragic way, but it also educated America that LGBT people were everywhere. You mentioned earlier um, that one of the first cases for Lambda Legal was uh, for Lambda Liga itself, um, trying to establish that it had a viable nonprofit purpose in the state of New York. Uh, obviously, that was ultimately successful because here you are today. Um, but I'm I'm curious to talk about lawsuits. You know, that's mm -hmm. one of the, the tools that Lambda Legal uses. We're a law firm um, and I'm you know personally familiar with a number of the cases that have been brought over the years. Uh, but, you know, going back to the 1970s, I guess, if you could talk about what you see as sort of some of the more uh, pivotal or more interesting cases, that would be uh, mm -hmm. that'd be terrific to hear. Boy, there's so many. Uh, let me just pick a few. Our second lawsuit was called Bonner versus Gay Student Group. And this won the rights of LGBT students to have student groups on their college campuses. So if you are LGBT and you went to college, you belong to an LGBT student group, you have Lambda Legal to thank for that because we won you that right in 1974. Uh, in 1983, we won the first federal lawsuit uh, causing protections for people with HIV AIDS from discrimination. Uh, that was uh, People versus Little West 12th Street Tenant Corporation. Um, but a couple of the lawsuits that I think we're most famous for are of more recent vintage. 
first of all, Lawrence versus Texas, which was a Supreme Court decision in 2003, which struck down the remaining sodomy laws that existed in America. I think for some of your younger associates, it's probably pretty shocking to learn that in the 21st century, in 17 states, it was still illegal to be gay in America. Uh, and it was Land Illegal's Lawrence versus Texas lawsuit where we represented Tyrone Garner uh, and John Lawrence of Houston, Texas against the state of Texas, which had arrested them um, for a same-sex relationship and that made its way to the Supreme Court in 2003 that ended those discriminatory laws, which as we noted from the slides earlier, go all the way back to 1642. Uh, a second lawsuit I would highlight is Obergefell versus Hodges, in which we were co-counsel, and which resulted in 2015 in the legalization of same-sex marriage and making marriage equality the law of the land in America. So those are just a few of the lawsuits that I that Land Legal has been involved in that I'm personally fond of. There's one more I'm going to throw in there as a former high school teacher, uh, Nabuzny versus Podlesny, which was a 1996 decision where a school was held liable for the first time for failing to protect LGBT students from bullying and harassment. Uh, that set a really important precedent uh, that is still used by students who are being bullied and harassed today uh, to represent them against their schools when their schools fail to do the right thing. So there's just been a, a, an innumerable number of lawsuits that Lambda has been involved in which have established landmark rights for LGBT Americans and people living with HIV. And how does Lambda Legal approach the lawsuits? In other words, it's sort of a multi, I guess, pronged question, but um, you have in-house lawyers that take the, mm -hmm. on this work. Do you associate also with firms outside or with other organizations? Um, for example, Lawrence versus Texas, I imagine that was a case that went on for many years as it worked its way through the courts. If you could describe sort of the process for how Lambda Legal, um, you know, identifies plaintiffs that it thinks, uh, you know, have a case that's worth fighting for and then how you proceed from there. Great question. So, first of all, we are so grateful to our pro bono partners, because if it wasn't for the firms that partner with us, we would never be able to do all this work. I mean, we only have 30 some lawyers. Um, we're tiny um, compared to something like KNL Gates. So the way it generally works is we have a national legal help desk and we take over 5,000 inquiries a year from people who suffered from discrimination. They then go one of two places. If there is the possibility of making new law through impact litigation, we represent them. If it is a uh, more of a legal aid society type thing um, where they're seek simply seeking legal representation, we have a cooperating attorneys network of attorneys around the country and we refer to them to someone in their region who can help them. So we only take a tiny fraction of the calls we get ourselves because we're not a legal aid society. We are an impact litigation shop. So we're, we're really interested in the suits that could make new law and set new precedents. Um, we have subject matter experts on our staff. For example, right now we're prioritizing uh, winning new protections for the most vulnerable in our community. As some of the people we've identified as the most vulnerable, for example, are LGBTQ seniors and LGBTQ youth. And our youth practice, we have an attorney who specializes in school-based suits and an attorney who specializes in what we call out-of-home care, which is kids in foster care, in homeless shelters, in group homes, so on and so forth. So what would happen is, um, if we were to represent a young person uh, who came through our helpline, we would um, then look for a firm that was willing to partner with our subject matter expert who would work with the firm to bring the suit. So we're constantly partnering with firms because frankly, they have the muscle that we don't have as a tiny organization to bring to some of these suits, which take many years. Like for instance, many people are familiar with the landmark decision last summer, Bostock versus Clayton County, which held that Title IX prohibits discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. Land Legal first argued that in court in 2006. It took 14 years for that to come before the Supreme Court. So we are often engaged in suits over a period of many, 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 many years before they finally make it through the system. So having firms that can partner with us and help sustain that work is really critical. The second way we get um, lawsuits, frankly, is we identify a discriminatory law and we go out and we find a plaintiff. 
like in the case of the uh, President Trump's unfortunate ban on trans people serving in the military, we went out and looked for trans service members who wanted representation. And we found the people who were ideal plaintiffs and we represented them. And we got that ban on trans people serving the military stayed for 18 months. So typically people will come to us, usually through our legal help desk, but occasionally we'll find a law that is so egregious that we will go out and find them. Pretty amazing what you've been able to accomplish. Um, you know, in the case of, in the, you know, you made the example of the the fourteen year, um, you know, track record for the case first brought in two thousand six. Were your pro bono, you know, uh, firms that you partnered with was it the same people along for the entire hall? Um, you know, that's I just know from my own experience, people come and go, and and you end up with new faces at firms, and and just curious how that uh, how that works out when you have such a long. Um, you know, a long trajectory. You know, what tends to happen is the firms stay the same, but the faces do tend to change sometimes. Um, because, you know, people, it's been fascinating for us, actually. We have what we call Lambda alumni, who are people who started as interns for us, then went to firms and became associates and are now senior partners. Um, and, you know, often, some of the times we have struck up those relationships through people who started off as interns at Lambda, who ended up at major firms who said, I wanna to continue to work with Lambda Legal um, and have partnered with us over a number of years. But you know, as you know, um, associates come and go, partners come and go. So it tends to be the firm is a constant, but some of the individual lawyers change. Although in some cases, like Paul Smith, who was with Jenner and Block for many years, stayed with the Lawrence versus Texas case the entire time, which took many years. Um, so sometimes we have the pleasure of working with somebody over five, 10, 15 years on a case. That's terrific. And how rewarding to get a successful result in the end. Um, are there any cases that are sort of pending now, you know, working their way through courts of appeal that, um, you think are noteworthy? Oh, there's so many. Um, there's a case which we're waiting for a ruling on right now called Fulton versus the city of Philadelphia. This case is a little bit under the radar because the oral argument was literally the morning after the election. So nobody was really paying attention to the Supreme Court on November 5th. Um, but this case, the um, Catholic Charities of in Philadelphia took a government grant to provide child um, placement services, then decided that they would not allow LGBT families to be sites of placement. The city of Philadelphia says, we have a non-discrimination law here. You have to obey the law. You signed a contract. Catholic Charities argued back, um, well, this violates our religious beliefs. So, no, we don't have to obey the contract. And the suit has ended up at the Supreme Court. Um, that ruling, which obviously will come by the end of June because it was argued this session, will set a very important precedent over um, which holds sway, non-discrimination laws or the religious beliefs of the service provider. Obviously, Lambda Legal believes that non-discrimination laws should hold sway. Uh, I think it's a very dangerous thing to start saying you cannot obey a law because you object to it based on your religion. Uh, I think that's a very slippery slope. Um, we argued a similar case against HHS called County of Santa Clara versus HHS when there was a proposed rule uh, under the Trump administration that would have allowed healthcare providers to refuse healthcare to people uh, without even an emergency exception in the law. So somebody literally could have been dying and the, the healthcare provider could have refused to serve them. Luckily, we got that, that rule stayed in court. Um, the second, so the whole issue here of religious exemptions is gonna work its way through the courts. It's gonna be very, very important. Then there are cases that are trying to advance affirmative rights for LGBT people. And I'll tell you about one of my favorites. Um, which is the Adams case out of Florida. Drew Adams was a high school, a trans high school student in St. Augustine, Florida. Um, he was told that he could not use the um, bathroom that was appropriate for his gender as a male because he was trans and we represented him. And it's the first lawsuit to ever actually go to trial around the use of a school bathroom by a trans student. We have prevailed at the district court. We've prevailed at the circuit court. The um, St. Augustine School District has now asked that the um, suit be heard on banc by the entire circuit. 
we're waiting for that. And I predict this will go to the Supreme Court. Um, and that'll be a very important precedent as well, because it will establish hopefully the right of trans people to use facilities appropriate to their gender identity, which at the current time they don't necessarily have. A um, couple questions on some of the examples you mentioned. The Philadelphia case, curious, I mean, is, is one of the key factors going to be the fact that the Catholic charity took the government grant as opposed to if it was raising its own funds, you know, and wasn't receiving government assistance? Would that um, have an impact on, you know, the argument? That's exactly the argument we're making at Lambda Legal, which is that if you raise your own money and you provide your own services as a religious institution, that is your business. We find it unfortunate that you would choose to discriminate in a soup kitchen based on sexual orientation or gender identity, but frankly, um, you probably have the right to. Things change when you take government funding and you agree to a contract that says you will not discriminate. Um, so I think the key factor here really is the one you just cited, which is, are we going to respect government laws or not? Um, and I think it's actually very frightening if we're going to decide that private actors can trump government laws, because then essentially we start down the road of not being a nation of laws anymore. Right. I mean, that certainly has impacts far beyond uh, LGBTQ issues. Um, exactly. If if that were the decision, right. Um, and another thing, and I, I'm asking some of these questions because I'm not a litigator, so I'm always kind of curious how this works. The St. Augustine School District case that. You know, litigation that goes from district court to, you know, on banks, it, it takes years, costs money. Is the school district funding, you know, its defense of that itself, or does it have, you know, solicit the same sort of pro bono assistance that Lambda Legal would? Yeah, there's a whole parallel universe of organizations on the other side of Lambda Legal, such as the ADF, formerly known as the Alliance Defending Freedom. That basically does the same thing we do, but upholding right wing beliefs. So often, you know, the the plaintiff is an individual, but Lambda Legal uh, is standing behind them on, on one side, and the ADF or a similar organization is standing behind them on the other side. Understood, and that makes sense. Um, Going back to the marriage equality case, uh, which obviously was a was a huge victory for the LGBT community, and I think some people um, outside the community sort of see it as like, okay, it's it's done. You know, there's nothing more to worry about there. But is that really true? Well, marriage equality was a huge milestone, and I don't in any way want to diminish how important it is. But for example, forty percent of homeless youth in this country are LGBT. And many of them are living on the streets, engaging in survival sex, putting themselves at great physical risk just to survive. And we're very proud of having one marriage equality, but we're under no illusions at Lambda Legal that the right to marry is the number one thing on the mind of a homeless LGBT youth who's engaging in survival sex. So we know that there's enormous amounts of work that remain to be done. Uh, that's why we've prioritized protecting the most vulnerable in our community, like LGBT youth, like trans people, like LGBT seniors, like people with HIV, LGBTQ immigrants, folks who uh, are still very much vulnerable to discrimination and harm in our society. So I want to salute marriage equality, and we certainly are very proud of the role we played in winning it at Lambda Legal, but I also want to acknowledge that that solved the problems of a small subset of our community and that there are many, many, many uh, subpopulations in the LGBT community that are nowhere near legal or lived equality, and that's the people we're choosing to focus on now. You know, what are some of the reasons behind the kind of shocking statistics about the percentage of homeless youth that are LGBT? Um, you know, I, I can imagine a number of them have been sort of exercised from their homes by families who didn't agree with their sexuality, um, that perhaps they have greater problems getting employment. Um, I, I'm curious what Lambda sees out there, because that's such a, you know, fighting laws and, and working to have, um, you know, public systems in place to help LGBT homeless youth. 
is a huge issue, but then it, you're you're talking about causes that are almost beyond the, the scope of what could be accomplished. Yeah, we're very aware of the limits of litigation as a strategy to solve every societal, societal problem. That's why we also do public policy advocacy. It's why we also do public education, because not everything can be solved through a lawsuit. Um, many things can, but not everything. And you're absolutely right in your diagnosis. Um, lots of kids end up on the street because their families reject them or because they um, are bullied and harassed at school. We know that LGBT youth are much more likely to drop out of high school than non-LGBT youth. And, you know, without an education, without a permanent address even, it's virtually impossible to get a job in America. So that is what forces many of them into survival sex, um, which leads to greater incidence of HIV contraction uh, and uh, the greater risk for street violence. Uh, we know, for example, trans people are four times more likely to be victimized by violent crime than cisgender people. That was, just came out of the new National Crime Victimization Survey that was published by the feds. So these kids are just at enormous risk. Um, and yes, there are important lawsuits we can bring to make sure, for instance, that service providers are making sure that all services are provided without discrimination. But frankly, it's also going to take a lot of education and a lot of public policy to solve this problem. It's not all going to be solved in the courtroom. What can the general public, you know, if, there's, if people are concerned about the issue, what can they do, um, you know, in terms of pro bono activities, donating to organizations? I mean, it's we have a, a obviously a massive problem with homeless in general in this country, of which this is you know another subset. But um, it's it's always so much more difficult to watch um, when it's youth that you know their mm -hmm. families have turned away. Yeah, now as a former high school teacher, it's one of the most heartbreaking things in the world to me. Um, I just can't imagine rejecting your child like that. It blows my mind. I would say that. Um, there are three things I would advise any individual to do. Use your money, use your time, use your voice. Use your money, obviously, as was mentioned, Land Illegal relies on private contributions to exist. So do other organizations like us. If you have uh, the resources, share them. Secondly, if you have the time and specific skills, you can become an attorney in our cooperating network um, or the firm itself can become a pro bono partner. And then number three, use your voice. Um, if you see bad things that are happening, contact our help desk. Let us know. As I often say, we're only as good as the information people give us. Unless we know what is happening on the ground um, in communities, we can't work towards solutions. So making clear that uh, there is representation out there for people in the form of land illegal is very valuable to us as well. Um, we often get unsolicited calls that turn into precedent setting lawsuits. And so use your voice, let people know we're here and that we're a resource. Use your money if you can spare it and use your time if you can spare that. Great advice. Uh, you also mentioned that one of the focuses of Land Legal right now is um, senior LGBT, LGBTQ individuals. Uh, can you take a moment just to describe some of the, the problems that are uniquely facing that group? Well, one of the saddest stories that I hear often is when se LGBT seniors need to enter care homes, they often have to go back in the closet because those care homes are not welcoming or supportive of them as LGBT people. In fact, 48% of same-sex couples that have sought senior housing have experienced discrimination, report experiencing discrimination when they're seeking the housing. So I think we have a long way to go in terms of providing uh, supportive housing to LGBT seniors. Um, for many, many years, LGBT people could not legally form families as well. So LGBT seniors uh, are more likely to be alone than non-LGBT seniors. So there's a need for social supports. And um, LGBT people, frankly, are poorer than non-LGBT people. This is a documented fact. So LGBT seniors are more likely to live in poverty. So we face the um, triple whammy of people who are isolated, people who are poor, and people who cannot access supportive services. And all of those are problems we need to address. And as part of the problem for, um, you know, finding housing, you know, nursing home care or whatever it may be at that stage of life, 
is that due to the fact that you know a number of the organizations that provide that are private and are supported by a yes. religious affiliation? That's exactly the problem. Um, that much of the care is provided by organizations that do not have a history of affirming LGBT people. Um, switching gears, you know, briefly. I, obviously, this is an international law firm. We have offices all over the globe. Um, you've spoken a bit about the problems that are, you know, currently facing U.S. LGBTQ people, but I'm wondering if you can spend a few minutes talking about uh, what you see internationally, and then secondarily, um, what role, if any, Lambda Legal plays in those matters. Um, it's probably pretty shocking to some people on the call. And let me just say, first of all, how delighted I am to see that our number has broken 600. That's amazing. Um, it's still illegal to be gay in 69 countries in this world. And in 13 of them, it is a capital crime. You can literally be put to death in 13 countries because you are gay. Uh, that is, I think, appalling. I think that we have not formally gotten involved in the international arena in the same way. It's something we're thinking about doing. We've had, frankly, our hands full here in America, uh, but we have provided technical assistance to groups that are seeking to do impact litigation in other countries. And we've done some training for lawyers from other countries. Um, I think that one of the things that a firm like KNL Gates can do is once again, I said, there's three things you do use your time, use your money, use your voice. Um, for um, a firm to speak up and say, you know, we want to have the best lawyers possible in our offices, no matter where they are in the world. And if you're telling us certain offices are off limit for our LGBT colleagues, you're reducing the likelihood that we can have the best lawyers in our office. I think that's a unique argument that businesses can make that this actually works against the business purpose of the business, which is to get the best talent, right? Um, and if you are denying segments of the population based on their identity, you're reducing your talent pool. So I think that businesses actually have a unique argument they can make to governments that have not yet gotten with the program uh, that it's actually bad for business to discriminate. And we know this and we urge you to change your policies because it simply is bad for business when you discriminate. That's great. Um... Switching back to the US then, you know, if you could describe a little bit more about Lambda Legal's operations, you mentioned you have about 30 lawyers on staff, uh, but you also do public policy work. Do you have lobbyists? I mean, or do you affiliate again with outside organizations to, to do that work? Well, as everyone knows, um, there are limits on how much lobbying a 501c3 can do, and we've done what's called a 501h election. So we track every minute very carefully to make sure that we don't violate any federal laws. But we do have a public policy office in Washington, and then we have regional offices in New York, Atlanta, Dallas, Chicago, and Los Angeles. And we've carved the country up into five regions so that uh, there are people on the ground in every part of the country. Because frankly, the situations in New York and Seattle are very different than they are in Dallas and Birmingham. So we need to have representation in every part of the country to make sure that we're being sensitive to local dynamics uh, and local cultures. So we operate through the five regional offices as well as a public policy office in Washington. That's great. And and the the how do you how does Lambda Legal receive its funding? Um, I know here in Seattle there's an annual summer fundraiser, a, a garden party that uh, you know many of us attend. Do you have similar events elsewhere? Do you get corporate funding? Um, it's a it's a huge Lambda undertaking Legal, to run all that. Lambda Legal over eighty percent of our funding comes from individuals. Um, we do have a lot of strong law firm partners that help a great deal as well, both with pro bono hours. If you count in the pro bono hours, we receive literally millions and millions and millions from law firms a year. Many of them also donate cash. Uh, but Land and Legal really is an organization funded by the people. Um, you know, the um, average gift is uh, barely over $100. So we're really very much funded by grassroots people in the community who want to see what we're doing succeed. That's great. Um, Kevin, I, you've been involved in LGBT rights for several decades now. Um, I'm curious to hear about sort of your history, how you came to be engaged with that, um, and then also how you came to be with Lambda Legal and um, what your time like there has been like and how you see the, you know, it ensuing going forward. 
Well, I marched in my first pride parade 35 years ago. Uh, so for many of your asso associates on the call uh, before you were born, and I was at the time a high school teacher, and um, I actually lost my first job over my sexual orientation. Um, and my second job, I was very nervous about anyone finding out that I was gay. So I've always said to LGBT teachers, though, it's a glass closet. The kids always know who the gay teacher is. And sure enough, a gay student figured it out and came to me and confided in me and said he was um, thinking of committing suicide. I was 24 and in over my head, to be frank. And so I said, Let, let's go see a counselor. And he said to me something I'll never forget. He said, why shouldn't I kill myself? My life isn't worth saving anyway. Now, eight years before when I was 16, I had tried to kill myself. So I knew exactly how this young man felt. And I made myself a promise that day that whatever I did with the rest of my life, I would work to make sure the next generation of LGBT kids did not grow up wanting to kill themselves. So a couple of weeks later, I was teaching in Concord, Massachusetts uh, for anybody in the New England area. I got up at the school and I gave a talk at a school assembly where I came out to the entire school. This is November 10th, 1988, by the way. Ronald Reagan is president. The AIDS crisis is felling gay men by the tens of thousands. Only Wisconsin protects you from discrimination based on sexual orientation. Very different time. And the next day, a young girl storms into my office. And I was kind of like, can I help you? Because she wasn't my student. She wasn't on a team I coached. I was like, hi. And she said, I want to start a club to fight homophobia. And I was kind of surprised. Um, so I said, tell me why you care so much about this, thinking she would tell me she was gay. Uh, and she said, that's easy. My mother's a lesbian, and I'm tired of hearing my family get put down around this school. Naive little me had never thought about the fact that I might have students who had LGBT parents. It just had never crossed my mind in 1988. So I said to her, I said, oh, okay, well, um, what do you want to call this club? And she said, I don't know. You're gay and I'm straight. Let's call it the Gay Straight Alliance. And that was literally the first Gay Straight Alliance at a high school in the world. November 11th, 1988, Concord, Massachusetts. Um, I'm very proud that we began to work with Lambda Legal shortly thereafter. I founded an organization called GLSEN, which works to address uh, homophobia and transphobia in schools. One of the lawsuits that we worked on together was Colleen versus Orange County Unified, which won the right in 2000 of students to form gay straight alliances in their schools. Just like we won the right of college students to organize in 1974 and 2000, we won the right of high school students to organize. And my life kind of went on from there, including a stint as Assistant Secretary of Education for President Obama. I came to Lambda Legal two years ago um, because it seems very clear to me what the strategy is of the people opposed to equality. Just like they've done to a woman's right to choose, just like they did to the Voting Rights Act of 1965, they plan to come through the courts and chip away, chip away, chip away, chip away at everything land legal has won in the last 48 years. They want to roll back all the victories. And I had two thoughts. First of all, I did not spend the last 36 years of my life fighting for these rights to see them taken away now. And number two, from my work with homeless kids, for instance, I knew how many people were still hurting and how much further we still had to go. So I decided to accept the offer to come to Lamb Legal. I've been here for 18 months as of yesterday. Um, it has been very interesting to start running an organization and three months in be relegated to Zoom. Um, and I have colleagues that I've only seen in person once or not at all, given our multiple regional offices. And uh, nevertheless, Lambda Legal has plugged on in some ways, as people at KML Gates know. The pandemic didn't hit us as hard as some other businesses. As lawyers were used to going into their offices, closing the door, and writing briefs anyway, and they discovered they could do that in their home office pretty much as efficiently as they could in their um, Lambda Legal office. So we've been able to keep going. Uh, it has been challenging, but you know we have continued to bring important lawsuits. Like, for instance, here's one that many people are not aware of. You might remember that the Trump administration announced it was going to ban the use of federal funds to train people about racism. 
Lambda Legal is the organization that got that ban stayed in court in December of 2020. We were the ones who went to court and stopped that from happening. So we have continued to bring important lawsuits throughout the pandemic. We're looking forward now, we're allowing vaccinated people back into our offices uh, to being together again, because there is a tremendous amount of work remaining still to be done. Thank you for that. And I'll thank you personally right now for your, your many years, you know, that you devoted to these causes. That's uh, your description of the, the student coming to see you is, you know, it's pretty powerful and it's also heartbreaking, you know, to know that there's people in that situation. What do you think it's going to take in America for attitudes to change? Um, you know, you mentioned the the people on the other side that are constantly trying to chip away with lawsuits. You know, what is the motivation? Why is mm -hmm. there this sort of systemic um, opposition to people being gay and living out their lives? Well, first of all, um, let me make sure everybody knows they're happy ending to the story. I'm going to share a slide that will scare the hell out of the first year associates, if I can do that. Um, this is me with the kids from the first GSA in the country at the 1993 March on Washington for LGBT rights. That's me in the Glisten shirt right there. Yes, this is what 20, 31 years will do to you kids. Um, that's what I used to look like. And let me tell you two happy endings to the story I just told you. First of all, the young woman who started the GSA, her name is Meredith. She's 46 now. She's married to a man. She has two kids. She lives in Boston. We had coffee shortly before the pandemic broke out. And the student, Brewster, is now 50. He lives in uh, Brooklyn, New York, with his husband of 12 years. I was happy to attend their wedding many years ago, and I uh, had a Zoom call with him back in February to wish him a happy 50th birthday. So everything had a happy ending. I want to assure people that. Um, and I come from a fundamentalist Christian family. My father was a Southern Baptist evangelist. And I don't want to demonize people of faith because I am now myself an Episcopalian and a regular churchgoer. Uh, and I know many people of faith who speak up for justice and equality for LGBT people because their faith tells them to. But unfortunately for some people, uh, there remains a belief that being gay is morally wrong um, and that it would be wrong to treat people equally when they are guilty of moral depravity, which is how they see it. And those folks are not going away, unfortunately. Um, they're very dedicated to their beliefs. And I suspect that Lambda Legal, like I said, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary in two years, will need to be around for at least another 50, because I don't think this battle will be concluded probably in my lifetime. I think that the British politician, Tony Benn, who once said, there's no final victory and no final defeat in the fight for equal rights is right. That each generation needs to pick up the baton to hopefully, like in a relay race, get a little further around the track of justice than they started. But you got to keep running. You got to keep fighting. Uh, the only reason things change, like Andy Warhol once said, he said, people tell you time changes things. Actually, you have to change them yourself. That's the only reason things change. When Lambda League was founded in 1973, 45 states still prohibited same-sex relationships. That didn't change because years went by. It changed because people had the vision to create Lambda Legal, and we fought for 40 years until Lawrence versus Texas in 2003 to get those laws ruled unconstitutional. So change takes time, change takes persistence, change takes determination, change takes action. That's why change occurs. Well, and powerful, uh, the work that Lambda Legal is doing. I, I'm, you know, as a father of a couple teenage kids, um, you know, I see the world much different now, the world that they are in than when I was in high school. Um, you know, attitudes have changed. Granted, I live in Seattle, not in small town Utah or where have you. Um, but, you know, you turn on the TV, you watch movies, it's, it's, certainly not uncommon anymore to see a gay character you know what right. maybe was unusual will and grace first came on tv now is is pretty commonplace um and i don't see in my kids generation you know the same kind of uh 
sort of trash talk, if you will. I mean, you know, when I was in high school, it was very common, you know, derogatory, just call somebody a faggot or, you know, I mean, that was that was the norm um, mm -hmm. then. And I don't see that now. And there's gay couples that go to prom and, you know, and the like. So, um, you know, but is that sort of progression in your you know, experience limited to certain portions of the country and in other places, say, southern Alabama, you know, um, that that's just not the case. And so what may seem like progress is really, to your point, limited because it, it only affects a certain portion of our society. I think the progress, the word I would use is it's uneven. Um, that. I grew up in a little town called Lewisville, North Carolina, which is near a city called Winston-Salem. Um, unpaved dirt road, trailer park, first person in my family to go to college. You know, very different time. Winston-Salem just elected its first out LGBT city council person. You know, if you had told me as a small child in the 70s in Winston-Salem that someday one of the city council people would be an out gay man, I would have wondered what drugs you were on. So. I do think that it's important to recognize that there's no part of the country that has monopoly on tolerance or um, bigotry. For instance, the Nabuzny decision, which I mentioned uh, before, which held that LGBT students were protected from sexual orientation and gender identity bullying and harassment. That's who was actually in Wisconsin, which was the same state that was the first one to pass a law saying you couldn't do that. So there's no place that has monopoly on tolerance. But what I will say is that I do feel like attitudes are changing and they are changing sometimes in the most unlikely of places. We represented a wonderful young man this year in Texas who wore nail polish to school and was told that he had violated the school dress code and was suspended. And we went to court uh, and the school district changed its policy as a result of that. In small town Texas, the school board saw the light and changed its policy. Now, it's unfortunate it took a threat of a lawsuit to get them to do that, but they did the right thing. So I agree with you, the progress is uneven, but there is progress. The world is substantially different than it was when Lambda Legal was founded in 1973, in large part thanks to the work of people like organizations like Lambda Legal. But I think the number one thing studies show that changes people's attitude towards LGBT people is when you actually know someone. So. I would say to LGBT folks who might be on this call today, the number one thing you can do to help is just to come out. Because when people know someone who's LGBT, it's been shown that their attitudes towards LGBT people tend to change very dramatically. I know this because when I came out to my mother in 1981, she disowned me. Just like 10 years before she disowned my older brother when he married a black woman. At the end of my mother's life, my mother was a full-time volunteer in an AIDS hospice that served primarily gay black men. She made that journey because she came to know black people. She came to know gay people. This was a woman whose father and brother were in the Klan. And I always say, if my mother can learn, everyone in America can learn. Well, Thank you for that um, and for your time here today. We're running up against the end of our hour, Kevin, and I don't know if there's anything else you would like to say, um, you know, to tell us that you think would be useful that we as lawyers should keep in mind or how we can help Lambda Legal, you know, in its efforts going forward. Well, like I said, use your money, use your time and use your voice. Um, those three things can make a huge difference. And I think it's important to recognize if you're lucky enough to live in a place like Seattle, the enormous privilege that comes with living in a community like that. That in places like rural Texas, where this young man was, um, kids are still getting suspended from school for doing innocent things like painting their nails. And I think, you know, American Express used to have this ad campaign. Membership has its privileges. I think membership has its responsibilities. That if you're lucky enough to be one of the people in the community who has the ability to live openly and honestly, you have a moral obligation to help people who are not as fortunate as you are, whether they're in other parts of the United States or other parts of the world. So please don't take for granted the freedoms that we have if you're lucky enough to have them. Please fight to protect them. Please fight to extend them. Please fight until everybody in the world 
feel safe and supported and affirmed. Thank you for that. Well, thank you very much for a fantastic opportunity. Thanks to the 600 plus people who joined us today. Uh, I imagine some of you in the early morning or late evening hours and happy Pride Month to everyone. Happy Pride, thank you, Kevin.